Looking for a cure for the winter blahs? Well, we could have the remedy this week on Motoring 99. TSN's Motoring 99 is brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oils, formulated for the vehicles you drive and the way you drive them, and Midas Car Care, the way it should be. This week we are in Sherbrooke, Quebec, nestled in the tranquil countryside of the Eastern Townships. Well, that tranquility has been shattered this weekend, but nobody has complained. Hello everybody and welcome to Motoring 99. Now Sherbrooke marks the very first appearance for what is one of the most exciting winter races in Europe. And organizers have brought teams and their cars over for this event, which they are calling the Canadian Ice Challenge. And believe me, the field is star-studded. We've even got three Formula One legends here, Patrick També, René Arnault and Jacques Lafitte. And you know, even if you're a seasoned race fan and you think you've seen everything, well, let me tell you, you ain't seen nothing yet. The event came to be uh, from the 24 hours of Chamonix. Uh, we've been, and Michelin's been involved for the last 20 years in this event, and it was a natural fit for us to get involved here in Sherbrooke. We've got about 30,000 tickets sold, but we're going to know at the end of the race how many people we got. The two-day event consists of 620 lap heats, alternating clockwise and counterclockwise directions. Each team must make one driver change per heat. This track has is, is been made from scratch, so there was nothing here. Uh, Mr. Jacques Gauthier, who is his uh, intendant, uh, did a marvelous job with the city of Sherbrooke. They put someplace 80 centimeters of, of ice, so it's a two months job to bring that track uh, at the level that right now all the drivers said that it's probably the best track in the winter uh, racing all over the world. Race is a race, but it's the people that we meet, the contacts that we make, and the merge of, of entrep entrepreneurs from here and from Europe, from Canada, from the United States, that uh, will come in the future. And uh, up to now, the comments are positive, and uh, we're looking forward for the future. The car uh, racing here in Sherbrooke are 400 horsepower, uh, four wheel drive, and uh, only two wheel drive with direction. And uh, it's a prototype. Uh, it's a car, uh, an Opel Astra, by example, is done in, a, you have only two in, in the world, like this. And uh, it costs a lot of money to do this, but it's a crazy car and fantastic car. The involvement really is just the exposure for the Michelin brand and to uh, better explain to the consumers why we're involved in the technology that's involved in the winter tires. They're a lot higher tech, I think, than people really understand. This is a Monte Carlo 1066-16 high-performance ice radial. As you'll notice, with the, it is a very thin tire. That's to keep the, the pressure very high on the ground. you notice that this tire is studded. The studs themselves are about 15 millimeters long, which is longer than a typical stud on a street tire. The stud is both glued and riveted, which keeps the stud within the tire because the vehicles that these run on are approximately 400 horsepower all-wheel drive and all-wheel spinning at all times. And this particular type of race tire is not street legal. It's a tire that uh, we use as a test bed 
and the things that we learn from this tire we'll apply to what we use on the street tires that we sell to the public. The tire beside is the Arctic Alpen, which is brand new for 1998-99 winter. This is an ice radial design specifically for the conditions in Canada. This tire works on the principle the same as a high performance tire, and that is the more rubber on the road, the better traction or adhesion on ice is the case that you'll have. You'll see that the tire is very flat. It covers a lot of ground. It approximately has about 32% more rubber on the road in the contact patch than does a typical standard winter tire. It's so much fun. It's good uh, uh, technical uh, uh, training during the winter and when you go to your racing season I think you are sharper, especially when it's wet, wet and, uh, and slippery. When you're driving a car, they tell you how to avoid understeer and oversteer. <laughs> Those rules go out here. Completely. Uh, here it's car control, pure car control. Uh, uh, you got to be smooth, obviously, to be efficient. When the conditions are a bit rough, uh, cars go every which way, but uh, car control then takes over. I'm pretty sure that Gilles Villeneuve would have loved that. I think they are teaching us some kind of a lesson. We have winter here, we do not know how to use our winter resources. If we listen to these guys and we can build up a, a, some kind of a championship of ice racing like they are, whatever it is, ice racing or snow racing, we can adapt their rules to our vehicles here and build up an incredible championship that will get us motor racing all year long. very happy to come back in Canada to race on your on your country because uh, the snow it's burn on your country and uh, I think that we, we come back and we, we have uh, many races for the, for the future in, in Canada this is the first year here on this track and I hope that next year we have American car uh, Europe car and uh, different driver too First of all, when you're on the highway at 100 kilometers an hour, it churns away at about 2600. You get up to 120 and it's pulling 3300 RPM and it lets you know that it doesn't like to work that high. When the Neon debuted, it was offered one of two ways, a Dodge or a Plymouth. This Neon 2000 comes but one way. The 2000 edition is an evolutionary design that's slightly larger in all critical areas. Most notably, the wheelbase is up by 25 millimeters and the track, well, it's wider by 18. The result is a more pronounced cab forward profile that provides more shoulder, head and hip room. While the two-litre single overhead cam engine remains unchanged, a few refinements means the power shows up for work a little earlier. Peak horsepower is still rated at 132, but it's reached at 5,600 RPM instead of 6,000, and torque now rates a healthy 130 pounds speed at 4,600 RPM. You know, the Neon's single biggest shortcoming is the fact that it's offered with only a three-speed automatic. Now this shortcoming is bad for two reasons. First of all, when you're on the highway at 100 kilometers an hour, it churns away at about 2600. You get up to 120 and it's pulling 3300 RPM and it lets you know that it doesn't like to work that high. The other problem, the Ford Escort and Focus and the Chevy Cavalier are all offered with a four-speed transmission. The McPherson strut base suspension has been completely redesigned and now features a front cross member that reduces the amount of engine and road noise transferred back to the passenger compartment. The revisions have also increased the suspension travel by 10mm up front and 25mm in back. This reduces the risk of bottoming out on a rough road. Driving through the pylons revealed no major vices. The Neon responds well to steering input and while there is a fair amount of body roll, understeer is benign. Without question the single biggest improvement to this Neon is found in the body structure. To begin with it's 37% better in bending and 26% better torsionally. This eliminates a lot of those really annoying rattles and squeaks. The other major improvement 
They've added frames to all of the door glasses. This gets rid of the nonsense of having to press the glass against a seal to eliminate wind noise. This system works much better, although you'll note I didn't say it eliminates it altogether. The upmarket LX comes with a full slate of attractive instrumentation and standard air conditioning and variable intermittent wipers. The front seats, which were a weak point in the previous car, are a major improvement. There's plenty of lumbar and lateral support and the seat is now height adjustable. The redesigned centre console offers two forward cup holders plus a third that will hold a big gulp. The AM FM audio package is quite simply the best in class, offering crystal clear sound through six premium Infinity speakers. In back, the seats are comfortable and split 60-40 to allow longer items to be carried with ease. As you can see, the difference between the old Neon and the new, well, it's basically evolutionary. And that's not a bad thing because the car is maturing with its intended audience. The problem is with that three-speed automatic. It'll drive a lot of consumers into the five-speed manual gearbox if you're going to get the best out of this car. And that may not be the best thing for that maturing audience. It's now time to wrap up our long-term Suzuki Grand Viterra. And you know, Suzuki has easily accomplished at least two of their three goals. The first one, to build a vehicle superior to the old sidekick. They've done it. Second, they wanted a product that will take on the competition, that being the Honda CRV and the Toyota RAV4. And they've done that too. On road, the Suzuki provides the only V6 in this segment. While off road, the four wheel drive low range allows it to go places usually reserved for larger vehicles. Inside, a nice control layout, except for these silly small radio controls. Cargo space is not large, but adequate. I mean, this is a compact sport utility. One thing I don't like, and other manufacturers do it also, is that the rear hatch opens from the right, right into the curb, blocking you. So you have to go around it, and hopefully not into oncoming traffic to try and load the back. But you know, all that aside, Suzuki has hit all the marks with their new Grand Viterra. But they still have one more goal to reach, and that is to prove to you that their quality has improved also. Well, after about six months and old 14,000 K on this one, they've convinced us. But like any brand new vehicle, we advise you to wait for the second generation before buying. With the sport utility market booming, it was hardly a surprise when BMW unveiled the X5 at the Detroit Auto Show. But BMW was not about to admit to playing catch-up, so... Well, what we don't like is they drive like trucks. and BMW couldn't build a vehicle like that. And what we also perceived is as people get, uh, the baby boomers uh, get to 50 and their children go off to college or whatever, they're looking for this kind of vehicle, but they're looking for more comfort, more sportiness, more individuality. So we believe there's a natural market there. Also with younger families, there's all the utility you need in a vehicle. So we think that there's a growing market which has tasted the SUV, found it wanting in many respects, and now wants something a little bit more sophisticated and a little bit more, if I may say, roadworthy. The vehicle will be built in South Carolina in Spartanburg and the powertrain will have a six-cylinder and an eight-cylinder in America. In Europe we'll have a diesel as well, a three-liter diesel. It's a vehicle which is built on a unique platform and it drives just like a BMW, looks just like a BMW, yet it has the advantage of four-wheel drive, a higher seating position which people like and all the safety that people perceive in a sport utility vehicle, but with the extra dimension of BMW safety like the head protection system. So we think we have created a new segment, much as we did a long time ago with the sport sedan. The BMW X5, an all new concept in motor vehicles. Oh really? Coming up later on Kenzie's Corner. 
Our Midas tip of the week concerns decals. I'm not talking about the decals that make your car look pretty. I'm talking about the ones that contain important information about servicing and repairing that car. And they're found in various different locations. For example, under the hood of this car, we can find a decal right here that describes the belt routing of the serpentine belt and one of the V-belts that drives accessories on this car. Over here is a decal that describes how much refrigerant to charge into the air conditioning system when it's serviced. Here's my pet peeve right here. Up in this corner of the hood is what we call the tune-up decal. It's got things like ignition timing, spark plug gap, and vacuum hose routing pertaining to this car. It's been completely covered up with undercoating or rust proofing material to the point where you can't read it. Now it's important to take good care of these things, keep them cleaned off and serviceable, and make sure that the personnel that are servicing your car are careful with these things, and, and if they have to replace a component they're attached to, to replace the decal as well, or at least cut it out and give it to you so that you've got that information. Now all this information can be had elsewhere in shop manuals, etc., but it's a heck of a lot harder to do. It's easy to have it right at hand when you're servicing the car. For example, that decal on the doorpost that gives you tire pressure and tire size, a very important thing that the average owner wants to refer to on a regular basis. That's your Midas Tip of the Week. We're back in Sherbrooke, Quebec, site of the first ever Ice Race Challenge of Canada. We've got another heat underway. Now, most of these cars can only be found in Europe, but there are some nameplates common to Canadian showrooms. We have a Subaru Forester along with two BMWs, a 318Ti and a Z3, a big crowd favorite, driven by Ari Vanton and a former World Rally Champion. Now this being the first time this event has been held here, it's a learning experience for everybody, the organizers, the drivers, and the spectators who must learn where and where not to stand. I guess I'm a slow learner. All right, now let's head to the garage and join Bill Gardner. Well, Brad, you're right. That sure looks like an exciting form of racing. Watching those guys power slide those cars all over the track was pretty neat. But I'll tell you something. Rene Arnault and uh, Patrick Tombe would be in trouble. If I still had the snow tires on the pickup truck, I'd drive down to Sherbrooke and wax those foreigners with their 400 horsepower heaps. This 200 horsepower uh, domestic pickup truck would swipe them right into the snow drift in no time at all. Anyhow, starting to sound a little bit too much like Coach's Corner here, I guess. Anyhow, let's go over to the workbench. I want to show you the result of neglecting your cooling system. This is a problem that many people are starting to find out the hard way got a perfect example on the workbench. We had an interesting job in the shop last week, a 91 Pontiac Grand Prix with a 3.1 V6 engine. Car had just over 200,000 kilometers on it, and the customer's complaint was that they were going through two to three liters of coolant every single day of the week. They'd have to top it up. They had a low coolant light in that car, and it would come on to flag the fact that the cooling system was low. They'd fill it back up. Everything seemed to be normal. Next day, it's down two to three liters again. They never saw it leak on the ground, and when we looked into it a little bit further, we found out that the coolant was getting inside the engine and actually taken part in the combustion event in one particular cylinder. We took all six spark plugs out of the V6 engine, found one spark plug to have some real significant white stains on it, so we keyed in on that one particular cylinder. And in, under normal circumstances, the coolant flows through these ports right here, and you can see how close proximity it is to the combustion chamber. And it's, com it's kept away and sealed from entering the combustion chamber by the cylinder head gasket. And you can see how it doesn't have to travel very far to get in there. Now if I lay the head gasket up on there, you can see that this corner of the head gasket was completely disintegrated. This is literally the way it came out. It was all corroded around here and it had fallen apart. The coolant was getting past there and into the combustion chamber. Now, under normal circumstances, the coolant should be sealed in here, but when the coolant gets corrosive and loses its corrosion inhibitors, it starts to eat out the castings. And it actually ate little craters into our head casting right here, ate out the corner of the head gasket, and eventually allowed the head gasket to pop or blow in this one area right here, and the coolant started trickling into that cylinder. Now you find that if you consult the maintenance schedule in your, in your owner's manual, you'll find that most cars prescribe a two or three year maintenance schedule between cooling system flushes and replacement of the antifreeze. However, there are some exceptions to that. In the last few model years, General Motors cars have come up with a new coolant called Dex Cool. It's a long life coolant, good for five years, and in many cases 240,000 kilometers before the first change interval. However, that's clearly stated in the manual which type of coolant it is and it'll tell you exactly when you should 
change out that coolant. It's very important, as you can see, that you do that on a regular basis to avoid just something like this. Until next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 99. This is the new BMW X5 sports activity vehicle. Now what's a sports activity vehicle? Well, one thing it's not is a sports utility vehicle. That's why BMW bought Land Rover so they could sell you sports utility vehicles. Well, I say if it looks like a duck, it waddles like a duck, and it quacks like a duck, chances are it's a duck. That, my friends, is a station wagon. They jacked it up, they threw a four-wheel drive system underneath it, but it's a station wagon. Now, they can't call it a station wagon because that's the kiss of death for marketing a vehicle in North America, although they do sell the BMW 5 Series station wagon, which is a very nice station wagon. Now, BMW also claims to have invented this marketing concept. Well, what was the Lexus RX 300? What that was, was a Toyota Camry station wagon, jacked up, four-wheel drive system slung underneath it, dipped in gold so they could justify a $45,000 price tag. Now, I'm not saying that this isn't a good car. It's a BMW, which means it'll probably drive really well. It'll have the same engines as the 5 Series, means it'll go like stink, probably handle beautifully, built like a tank. But my friends, I'm getting a little tired of this marketing cycle babble. It's a station wagon, and there's nothing wrong with that. I'm Jim Kenzie. Danny Snowbeck and Jamie Ruff here are the toast of Sherbrooke, having won the very first Canadian ice racing challenge in their Opal Astro. You know, as we mentioned earlier, this event is hugely popular in Europe, but it's never been seen here before. So organizers were just hoping to put on a good show here and hopefully expand this series to other centers in Canada and the United States. Well, the drivers came over here, no money on the line, but they raced like there was a purse of a million dollars, and the fans just loved them. And you get the feeling this new love affair can only get stronger in the years to come. That's it for now. We'll see you next time out for more stories about cars and the people who drive them. All-wheel drive inherently has an understeer characteristic to it, and now we have a car that can be driven very sportedly, it doesn't have understeer, and the system, if it does get understeer going into a corner, the system adjusts itself and eliminates the understeer. So it's a very uh, sporty system. TSN's Motoring 99 has been brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oils, formulated for the vehicles you drive and the way you drive them, and Midas Car Care, the way it should be.